In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My brothers and sisters, peace be with you. And with your spirit. We've gathered this morning as a family of faith to commend to the Lord of life and love our dear friend and our dear bishop, Bishop William G. Curlin. This morning I, I greet Bishop Eugis, good Bishop of Charlotte, Bishop Schlesinger, I greet Abbot Placid, Monsignor West, Monsignor Macaccio, Macaccio, who is our homilist, so many brother priests and deacons, our religious and seminarians, the Knights of Columbus, the Order of Malta, the Order of the Holy Sepulchre, and uh, our ecumenical and our interfaith colleagues as well, together with friends and parishioners from near and far. Let us ask now for the grace to unite in commending our dear Bishop to the Lord in praying for his eternal redemption and in celebrating this Eucharist with worthiness and with joy. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most serious fault. Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary of the Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Let us pray. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that the soul of your departed servant, Bishop William, to whom you committed the care of your family, may, with the manifold fruit of his labors, enter into the eternal gladness of his Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will provide for all peoples. On this mountain, he will destroy the veil that veils all peoples, the web that is woven over all nations. He will destroy death forever. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. The reproach of his people he will remove from the whole earth, for the Lord has spoken. On that day it will be said, Behold our God, to whom we looked to save us. This is the Lord for whom we looked. Let us rejoice and be glad that he has saved us. This is the word of the Lord. Shall 
beside restful waters he leads me, he refreshes my soul. reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. None of us lives for oneself, and no one dies for oneself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For this is why Christ died and came to life, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bend before me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us shall give an account of himself to God. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, yeah. 
The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne and all the nations will be assembled before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill, and you cared for me. In prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did for one of these least brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me you accursed, and to the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. A stranger, and you gave me no welcome. Naked, and you gave me no clothing. Ill and in prison, and you did not care for me. Then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty? or a stranger, or naked, or ill, or in prison, and not minister to your needs. He will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. And these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Archbishop Lori, thank you for celebrating this liturgy. Bishop Jukas, our bishop, to Bishop Ned Schlesinger, thank you for coming. Ned, I remember in the seminary our days together. Always a bridesmaid, never a bride. You know. <laughs> uh, we miss you here in North Carolina, but we're so glad you're in the province. Tabit Placid, Bishop's confessor and great friend. To all the priests gathered here, Bishop loved his priesthood, and I hope you know that he loved your priesthood. He said to me more than once in the evenings after all the ceremonies, that it was at ordination, it was at that moment that he felt most a bishop at ordination, to get the countless number of men that he ordained. To our permanent deacons, the bishop personally identified with diaconia's service in the Archdiocese of Washington was instrumental in the restoration of the permanent diaconate many years ago to all those in consecrated life, to all of our beloved brothers and sisters, our religious, you were brothers and sisters to him, and with his great love of nature, 
seeing the hand of the Creator and the beauty of creation here in North Carolina, he affiliated with the Franciscan Order. A lot of people don't realize that. Remo is here today. He was ordained by the bishop many years ago. He's now the provincial of the Capuchins. Last night, Remo and I placed a Franciscan cross in his sleeve. Bishop lived and loved beautiful, artistic, excellent, and elegant things, not because of their intrinsic value, but because of the sentimental value. They reminded him of family and friends. So he appreciated art. He appreciated so many things. And while the bishop did not take a vow of poverty like you, he lived so simply, sleeping, as long as I knew him, on a hard twin bed frame, cooking our meals at home, and doing the laundry, constantly doing the laundry. It was a sacramental. But it was also a Sabbath. You remember Bishop Jugas, you lived with him. He would go down into the basement of the big house, and there he would do laundry. And I think that's where he thought. It was like a Sabbath. It was like a Bethany for him. So I let him do mine, too. <laughs> to all of us who minister in the church, I'm reminded of the challenge he received as a seminarian. And we're so blessed to have seminarians. And, and we need seminarians and we need priests so desperately in our diocese, in our church. The challenge he received as a seminarian from a Sulpician priest, I think you probably know the story, Archbishop Snuffy Nevins, I believe it was Snuffy Nevins, who when they were first decked out in all their clerical attire, proud as peacocks, and the little priest came by and said to them with kind of a snarl, there's a whole lot of religion on you, but not much religion in you. <laughs> right then, it became clear to him if you didn't have Jesus in your heart, the people of God would see right through your clerics. On Sunday, after vesting the bishop for this liturgy, we stopped for dinner. Imagine me stopping for dinner. <laughs> and a little lady came to the table. She might be here right now. Came out of the kitchen, which was the kitchen staff, and came to us to offer her condolences and to ask what time the mass was, because those folks in the kitchen, they wanted to know what time the funeral was so they could pray with us. Yesterday, a young waiter came up to us while Tim and I were dining after doing some things and asked if we were Catholic priests. He says, we're here for Bishop Curlin's funeral. He said, I thought so. He said, he conferred me at St. Matthew's huge parish, as you know. In the year 2000, he knew the year. He says, I took the name George. I said, that was Bishop's middle name. He says, I know that. He told me that at the confirmation. Now, I want you to imagine that for a moment. In the midst of those massive confirmations, those massive ceremonies, to be able to make that lasting connection in that split second with that kid. Oh, and they have folks who might seem little or least in this kingdom praying for you. Well, that's how you get into heaven. With all the illustrious company we have in this room, we know that a lot of people who would like to be here, they can't be here because they're working hard. And so for, and to all the faithful here, and to those who are watching, just know that he loves you so much. And we pray that you feel, and we hope that you feel the power of this communion of prayer today. I recognize today also the Catholic daughters that are present. He was a former national champion, a chaplain. I recognize the ancient order of Hibernians. He was not an ancient Hibernian. In fact, he wasn't really Irish. People think that he was Irish, but the Curlin was a German name, kind of looked Irish, but there's a little bit of Irish in each one of us. And so we thank them for their presence, and I think we have a piper outside. To the knights and ladies of the Holy Sepulchre, 
year. You shared Bishop's deep concern for the Holy Land and the plight of our Christian brothers and sisters there as we work for a peace that's based on justice. To the Knights of Columbus, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for being in solidarity with the priest. Thank you for being so kind to the bishop in this funeral liturgy and standing in vigil with him. Thank you for your promotion of vocations that he loved in supporting our seminarians. And thank you most of all for your fraternal service to the church and to this great nation. And I want to thank you in a special way for all the rubber chicken dinners that we ate at your conventions. <laughs> to the knights and dames of Malta, the points on your habit, the points on your cross, on your habit, represent the Beatitudes. They are included on his holy card, the Beatitudes. Your ministry, your call, your mission, your religious order that is dedicated to defending the faith and serving the poor resonated with his ideas, especially the sick. The sick always had a special place in his ministry and in his heart perhaps because of his own severe illness as a child, and perhaps just because of his priestly heart. We all know that he was tireless in hospital visitation. And every year, he cherished the pilgrimage to Lourdes with Malta. That was his working retreat, one of the most special places on earth. Mary shrine there in the midst of the mountains, a place where the Beatitudes blossom and the last become first. Thank you for bringing the bishop, and thank you for staying with him when he had grown weak under the burden of years. Two of my favorite prayers that I learned from Bishop Curlin relate to his great devotion to the Blessed Mother and her intercession in our lives. You know it, some of you know it so well. Mary, Mother of Jesus, make me well, that I might better serve you, serve your son, amen. Mary, Mother of Jesus, make me well, that I might better serve your Son. Amen. You ask not to be restored to health for any selfish reason, but to glorify God and spread the gospel. And another one, and another one, with which we could open the Curlin Fertility Clinic was when parents would come to us asking for a child. This one really works. Mary, mother of Jesus, give us a child and we'll raise you a saint. Mary, mother of Jesus, give us a child and we'll raise you a saint. But my all-time favorite, I love short prayers. I love long homilies, but short prayers. <laughs> my all-time favorite was on a card framed by his bed. I'm, I'm sure Brian and Ron, Father Brian and Father Ron had seen that. A little card framed said, Your will, O Lord, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Amen. Great prayer. Your will, O Lord, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Amen. He knew that second reading. None of us live for ourselves but for the Lord. And when we let his will be done in our lives, that kingdom comes. To Mary Ellen, to Jim and Sharon, to Felix, to Paula and Ed, to John and Pat, to Gail, Darlene, Dick Cox, who probably can't be here, to Bob and Jackie. Oh, Bob, thank you for all you did for him and for the church. Bill Weldon, like a son to him. To Father's Mo, Father Paul, Father Mark, to Monsignor Jack, who can't be here, and especially to Father's Brian Cook and Father Ron Potts. We who were priests also had the privilege 
of being special spiritual sons. The bishop's passing was peaceful and so appropriate coming at this time of the year. As executor, I thought it would be good to continue this gift-giving season. And so on some of your pews, you see a star. There are two stars. And if you receive that star, you receive a present from Bishop Curlin, from his estate. One of his chihuahuas. They're spoiled rotten. I hope you get one. <laughs> Don't look for it. Actually, I want to thank Darlene, the team bishop. She took them, and they're already thriving. You know how happy he is about that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I personally thank you. <laughs> I was just joking. Bishop taught me Christmas isn't a day. Christmas isn't even a season. It's too big to can be confined to any liturgical calendar. In his home, there was no advent. Baby Jesus came around all souls day and left right before Lent. It was like the Griswolds happened inside. It was amazing. In his heart, Christmas wasn't a day. Christmas was a way of life. We believe through the mystery of the incarnation, the eternal word of God, it leaps down from heaven when half spent was the night. To be born in uncomplaining poverty, Jesus. A name that means savior. Begins the paschal mystery then. He who will open his arms on the cross offers that open embrace of a child waiting to be loved. In this holy exchange of humanity and divinity, our world has changed forever with the possibility of new life and a new way of loving. This was the life of Bishop Curlin. This was the basis of his incarnational spirituality. He saw good in things, good in people, always looking for Christ in each other, always looking for the hand of God in events in the splendor of creation. For him, Christ wasn't born just 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem, but Hodie, here and now, in the stable of our hearts, every time we welcome that word into our lives, reborn through Christ at baptism as we are, Bill Curlin believed Christ was waiting to be reborn through our living witness of God's word to the world. Mother Teresa said, I'm a little pencil in the hand of a writing God who is sending a love letter to the world. You probably wondered how long it would be before I mentioned her. <laughs> I used to guess, as a secretary, could tell the stories probably better than he could after a while. But I want you to believe this. I'm telling you, as a secretary... They were friends. They really were. And she would call when in America, often at odd times. One of the sisters, her mother herself, would identify. She says, Mother, I half suspecting it was one of my phone pranking priest friends would be like, Yeah, sure. <laughs> and it would be her. And after he would talk to his celebrated spiritual friend, he would come in, I'm not going to say proud, but very full and said, that was mother. She was in California. And to keep him grounded, I would say, not her again. <laughs> he loved to laugh. He loved to laugh. And I loved to make him laugh. And I think the archbishop and some of his dear friends know we would go and buy cards. And they were hilarious cards. Outrageous cards. I never got a pious card from him. They were so outrageous that he would usually sign them Holly, Brian, and me. Never, never putting his name, lest it be a stumbling block to his canonization. <laughs> he 
He loved to laugh. He had so much joy. Joy is an indicator of holiness. Joy is the fruit of a life well lived. It is the satisfaction that comes with service and sacrifice if you're doing the right thing, the Jesus thing. Like his friend, Mother Teresa, they believed in the words of another Teresa who said, Christ has no hands but yours. And so in his incarnational spirituality, Bishop would pray at night, Jesus, if you wake me up, I will wake you up in my life. And then in the morning, an even bolder prayer. Spoken with humility, though. Come, Lord Jesus, walk the earth in me. Not for the edification of Bill Curlin, but in a sort of surrender that he was willing to take the presence of Christ wherever it was needed that day. Jesus was real and present to him on the journey. Through the mystery of the incarnation of Christ celebrated in Holy Eucharist and in the deep and abiding friendships he had with him, and then the deep and abiding friendships that he made over his 60 years of priesthood. His goal was to think with Christ, to feel with Christ, to have in him the same attitude of Christ. This was his Episcopal motto, taken from the second chapter of Philippians, the passage printed in your program. Long before there were rubber banded bracelets or bumper stickers, Bishop Curlin was challenging us to think What would Jesus do? WWJD. To have in us the attitude of Christ and to think what Jesus would do. That's what made him a pastor. That's what made him a champion of the poor. What would Jesus do? Well, he did it. Whether in D.C. or N.C., in the inner city or in Appalachia, I was speaking to one of his longtime friends, an attorney, here today on the phone about the preparations. He started relating to me some stories that I said he should write down. But the things that happened in the bishop's life, he totally trusted in the providence of God through the intercession of St. Joseph to take care of the poor. Things that happened in the bishop's life, some of the achievements, they are beyond remarkable, nearing the miraculous. Crazy stuff that you wouldn't even believe if I told you, but they're real. His commitment to the poor and the sick was not a heroic social work, but it was a fruit of this deep spirituality. He knew that if Jesus walked the earth in him, he should look for him to do the same in others, especially in the distressing disguise of the poor. Isn't that how Christ first came to us? Isn't that how we will be judged by him in the end? Think of those readings today. Today's gospel. Could it be any clearer? When did we see you? When did we see you hungry? When did we see you naked? When did we see you imprisoned? Hungry for love and respect, naked, stripped of your human dignity, imprisoned by the cycle of poverty and addiction. One day, we will all give an account of how we loved to Christ. I give thanks for the example I had of incarnational eyes, though clouded by macular degeneration and cataracts. Those eyes that could still as they always saw, Christ hidden in the poor, hidden in the sick. To all those who ministered to the bishop in his later years and in his last illness, I say thank you. It was as if the bread of kindness that he cast upon the waters returned to him. He was independent. He was independent up until the end thanks to you folks. And he cherished that independence, and I thank you for making it possible. Archbishop Laurie, with your incredible busy schedule, 
that you are here today. You know how proud, he was so proud of you in your ministry. And he loved you so very much. I think it was your visit and prayers at the end that told him it was okay to come home for Christmas. And so he did. And now for him, Christmas isn't a day, it is forever. God the Almighty Father raised Christ his Son from the dead, and now with confidence we ask him to save all people, both living and dead. For our brother William, spent his life following Jesus, poor, chastised, and obedient. Count him among the holy men and women who sing in our courts. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Our brother William shared in the priesthood of Jesus Christ, leading God's people in prayer and worship. Bring him into your presence where he will take his place in the heavenly liturgy, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Many friends and members of our family have gone before us and await the kingdom. Grant them an everlasting home with your son, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We are assembled here in faith and confidence to pray for our brother William Strengthen our hope so that we may live in the expectation of your son's coming. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord God, giver of peace and healer of souls, hear the prayers of the Redeemer Jesus Christ and the voices of your people whose lives were purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Forgive the sins of all who sleep in Christ and grant them a place in the kingdom. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
pray, my sisters and brothers, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and all his holy church. We humbly beseech your boundless mercy, Lord, that this sacrifice, which your departed servant and Bishop William, while in the body offered to your majesty for the salvation of the faithful, may now bring him to your pardon. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, and with your spirit. spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In him the hope of blessed resurrection has dawned, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful Lord, Life is changed, not ended. And, with, and when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. Therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world together with your servant, Francis, our Pope, me, your unworthy servant, Peter, the bishop of this local church, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and the apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants. and all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them, we offer you the sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls, in hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Persogonus, John and Paul, Cosmos and Damien, and all your saints, we ask that through their merits and prayers, in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of your service and 
of your whole family. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become from us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, as Almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins, do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the Blessed Passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance, and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the Just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, Almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel, to your altar on high, in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants, especially our Bishop William, who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us, also your servants, who know sinners, hope in your abundant mercies. Graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon, through Christ our Lord. Through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord, you sanctify them, fill them with life, Bless them and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him Amen. and in him, O oh God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours 
the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. With the kingdom, the power, and the glory of yours now. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. And with you. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Peace. Yes. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only stay the word and my soul shall be.
second bottle of water, please.
Christ. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. The body of Christ.
Let us pray. May your merciful kindness, which we have implored, O Lord, benefit the soul of your departed servant, Bishop William, that by these sacrificial gifts, he may know the eternal company of Christ, in whom he hoped and whom he preached, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you so much, Bishop Hugis, for the privilege of serving as the principal celebrant of Bishop Curlin's funeral mass and for your constant presence, especially in the final days of his life. And thank you, Monsignor Marcaccio, for such a beautiful and wonderful homily that captured so well our good bishop and priest and friend. Thank you so very, very much. There's really two themes from Scripture that capture for me Bishop Curlin's life. The first is the self-giving love of Jesus, who expended himself endlessly in preaching and administering to the poor and sick, and finally laying down his life out of love for all of us. The second is love to the very end. As St. John says of Jesus, he loved his own in the world, and he loved them to the end. Father Curlin, Monsignor Curlin, Bishop Curlin, or Father Bill or Bishop Bill, gave of himself always, from his first days as the third assistant at St. Gabriel Parish in Washington, right down to the very last weeks and days of his life. Mention has been made many times of his love for the sick, but I can, I can share an experience of my own. Many years ago, as a recently ordained priest, I was in the car heading back to the parish when I began to feel chest pains, and I landed in the hospital. I think I was still in the emergency room, when none other than Monsignor Curlin appeared with the holy oils and the ritual and the best ever bedside manner. Next day, he walked into my hospital room with my mother, whom he had flown from Louisville, Kentucky, so that she could look after her son. Thankfully, I recovered I did not die in his arms. <laughs> and I did not become a retreat story. <laughs> Bishop Curlin was also the go-to person when things went wrong. My first pastor was one of Bill Curlin's very dearest friends, but they could not have been more different. My pastor would occasionally go into orbit, and when that happened, anything could and would happen, as on the day when he fired the housekeeper. I was awestruck. It was like witnessing a typhoon or an earthquake. And if this firing had been written up in an HR manual, it would be in the chapter entitled, Mistakes to Avoid. <laughs> Well, no sooner than this all happened than my pastor realized, to his credit, how wrong it all was. And of course, the person he would call was his dear friend, Bill Curlin. Monsignor Curlin dropped absolutely everything, rushed over to visit his friend and me, the bewildered assistant, but he never came empty-handed. He brought a large bag of Roy Rogers hamburgers and fries. <laughs> and before the end of the evening, 
He had us laughing at ourselves. He gave his good friend, my pastor, the right advice on how to resolve the situation justly and charitably, and gave me an invaluable lesson about priestly friendship and fraternity. No matter what he was doing, Bishop Bill would drop everything, especially when someone was in trouble or distress. How many of us in this church have been consoled and counseled and encouraged by this wonderful priest and bishop with an enormous capacity for friendship, but not just any friendship, but a friendship rooted in the Lord's love. How many priestly and religious vocations he fostered and saved, how many married couples he kept together. And I can tell you that he not only helped me to answer my call to the priesthood, but so many times when the going would get rough in times of discouragement, Bishop Bill was the one who bucked me up. Long before Pope Francis spoke about encountering the Lord and one another, about accompanying one another, about priests being close to their people, Bishop Curlin lived that reality, no matter what assignment he happened to be in. A few days after his death, one of the bishop's ecumenical colleagues said that Bishop Curlin exuded Christ, radiated Christ, radiated the joy of the gospel. This is why his ministry, I think, seemed to be so spontaneous, even effortless, preaching five seven-day retreats, three talks a day and a homily without a note, being free to go wherever he was most needed, an uncanny sense of what the real gospel priority might be in any given situation. This is not to say that he didn't experience deep suffering in his life, including deep spiritual suffering, and that suffering that comes when one takes the risk of loving other people selflessly. Yet when Bishop Curlin smiled at you, it was Jesus smiling, and when he embraced you, it was the embrace of Jesus. These last years, when we talk on the phone, the bishop would tell me that his days were quiet and not too many people came to visit. But of course, that wasn't true. <laughs> As I would see when I visit him in person, he did a land office business on the phone. As people called him, for advice or just to say hello. He was always out doing something, including saying mass for his beloved missionaries of charity or taking an out-of-town visitor to Maggiano's. <laughs> they lost their best customer. <laughs> and people dropped in constantly. I'm told that just a few weeks ago, a group of grade school students stopped in to see him. Bishop Curlin would have it no other way. He was born to be a priest. He was born to love. And he loved us to the very end, like Jesus. Bill, may your great priestly soul Rest in the peace of Christ.
We have received a message from the Vatican Secretary of State on behalf of our Holy Father, Pope Francis, which it is now my honor to read to the Church of Charlotte and to all of our guests and friends who are with us for this Mass. The Most Reverend Peter J. Jugas, Bishop of Charlotte. The Holy Father was saddened to learn of the death of Bishop Emeritus William G. Curlin, and he asked you kindly to convey his heartfelt condolences to the clergy, religious, and laity of the Diocese of Charlotte. In commending the late bishop to the love and mercy of Christ the Good Shepherd, he joins in your prayer of thanksgiving for the many graces that accompanied his years of devoted Episcopal ministry. To all who mourn Bishop Curlin in the sure hope of the resurrection, His Holiness cordially imparts the apostolic blessing as a pledge of consolation and peace in the Lord. Cardinal Pietro Parolin, Secretary of State. Please stand. Before we go our separate ways, let us take leave of our brother, William. May our farewell express our affection for him. May it ease our sadness and strengthen our hope. One day we shall joyfully greet him again when the love of Christ, which conquers all things, destroys even death itself.
Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our brother, Bishop William, in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, he will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you bestowed upon him in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn toward us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our brother forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In peace, let us take our brother to his place of rest. <laughs> 